I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine.
On behalf of the Price family, I want to welcome you to Peninsula Bible Fellowship. This was Susan's church. And we want to open up with a word from Job, a man who knew a lot about suffering. And yet this was his hope. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed... Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. It is that great hope to which we've gathered here today. I'm going to invite you to stand and join me in prayer. Lord, we've come to remember a very dear saint, the life of your child, Susan Price. Many of us today come with heavy hearts because her absence in this life makes our heart grow fonder. And indeed today, they are filled with fond memories. How grateful we are for the ways that her life intersected ours. How grateful we are for the beautiful tapestry of a human being you knitted together in her. Remind us today, Lord, that she has gone to be with you. And fill us with the strength of your promise, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know that Susan now knows that eternal home, and she is home there. Help us today to stand strong in that hope that you are the resurrection and the life, that those who live and believe in you shall never die May you be worshipped and adored, O giver of life. Amen. Amen. And let's say together a a, a couple of verses that were very dear to the Price family. It's kind of known as Gavin's uh, scripture. Would you repeat these uh, words that you'll see behind me on the screen? In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Thank you. You may be seated. Susan answered an altar call and asked Jesus into her heart when she was nine years old, and she never backed away from that decision. All through her life together, she was eager to learn more about God, to be always closer to him, and to love him more. And the way that she lived her life, the way she treated friends and neighbors and relatives, and the way she raised our kids, she always tried to reflect Jesus' love for us and her love for him. She was truly the modern version of the virtuous wife described in Proverbs 31. 
She was always dependable, both in our home and outside it. Whenever anyone in the family or any of her many circles of friends needed help, Susan was there to lend a hand or simply to be there to listen. She made every house we lived in, and there were quite a few, a home. <laughs> like 32 of them. <laughs> she always made them a home, welcoming and comfortable and homey, because that's how she was. She was the visionary and the main driver behind the businesses that we've had, and she worked so hard at them. And in large part, she was the one who made them successful. It was Susan who planned all the birthday parties, the family reunions, the get-togethers with family and friends. She thought of and arranged all of our family vacations to Disneyland, Hawaii, New Mexico. She was not only beautiful, she was the kindest, sweetest, and most thoughtful and generous person I've ever known. From early in our marriage, there have been many relatives and friends who we invited to stay in our home for weeks or months. It, it was usually after Susan convinced me to allow it. <laughs> Whether it was because they needed a place to stay temporarily or just because we loved having them around, Susan was always a loving and hospitable host. Also, anyone who was staying over on a Saturday night was expected to go to church with us on Sunday. <laughs> Susan loved reading and studying the Bible. She loved memorizing scripture. I was trying to think of which was her favorite. There were so many. But the one she quoted, or one that she quoted often, was Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Uh -oh. no, it's here. And she was a prayer warrior. She prayed every day for all of our kids and grandkids, and for everyone else on her prayer list. She added, well, I'll mess this up here. If she ever heard about anybody needing prayer, especially parents or grandparents who had lost a child. She especially kept them in her prayers. After our grandson Gavin passed away, she wrote a book about how she survived the grief of the loss through God's word and prayer. Then, before it was published, another grandson, our first, Bryson, passed away. And we got through that the same way with the scripture and prayer. Her book has helped several others that we know of who have lost one, one loved ones, and Susan was really happy about that. She was also a very brave person who practiced what she believed. Like Jesus commanded in Mark 12, she loved God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and she loved other people the same as herself. Because of this, if she knew or even thought that she had offended someone, she was quick to ask for forgiveness. When anybody hurt or offended her, she found forgiveness in her heart. It wasn't always immediate, but she couldn't hold a grudge for long at all. Since she was courageous. That was evidenced by the way she fought her 10-year-long battle with cancer. She faced all of the many doctor's appointments, tests, surgeries, infusions, and all the setbacks with the same trust in the Lord and the grace and sweetness that she lived her life with. Years ago, Susan told me that when she died, all she wanted was for people to know that she was a Christian. I told her that most people who knew her would already know that, <laughs> and the ones who didn't would not be surprised to find out. A very kind lady in Albuquerque asked me how long we'd been married. I told her 51 and a half years. She said, that's a long time. And it does sound like a long time, but it was way too short for me. Susan, I know I'll see you again in heaven, but until then, I will miss you every day of my life. I just love you so much.
I don't know how I'm going to get through it after listening to that. I want to read a, a couple of verses real quick in Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6, verses 6 through 8. For I am already poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. Anybody who knew my mom would agree that she was a very loving and compassionate and empathetic woman. And as such, it was not uncommon for her to become emotional when she was in the presence of people who were suffering. When she came across strangers who had fallen on hard times, she was the first person to offer aid and comfort, whether that was buying them a grocery bag full of food and putting some spare cash inside or just spending some time listening to their story and offering some encouraging words and a prayer. It was just her nature to share the pain and suffering of those around her and do everything she could to uplift them in their time of need. So with this in mind, it was very important for me to assure her that we are all going to be okay. After she passed, she didn't need to worry about us being too sad because we knew that she was going to be in heaven and that we'll all see her again when it's our time to be called home. And we were relieved she would no longer have to suffer the pain and anguish of having a terminal disease. And most importantly, that we'll always be there for each other in times of grief in the same way she was always there for us after Gavin and Bryson passed away. So when the time finally came, and we were informed that her health had taken a dramatic turn for the worst, and that her condition was irreversible, I decided it was time to have that conversation and put her mind and spirit at ease so she could go through the process of leaving Earth without the burden of worrying about how we were all going to, be, how we were all going to get by when she was gone. I asked those in the hospital room if they could give us time alone. After they left, I took a deep breath and thought to myself, it's time for you to be strong for mom. I sat down next to her, took her hand in mine, and looked into her beautiful eyes. However, before I could say a word, I began... I began to sob uncontrollably. I threw my arms around her. And all I could manage to say between the tears was, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then she held me in her arms, just like when I was a child. I could barely hear her soft voice over the medical machinery that was keeping her alive. She was just repeating the words over and over. My sweet baby boy, I love you so much. my sweet baby boy. And for the final time, my mom soothed my pain with her touch and comforted my heart with her words. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay. I love you so much, my sweet baby boy. So much for remaining strong, huh? I am so grateful that the whole family was together in the last days of her life. And although she was uncomfortable from being bedridden and the oxygen bothered her sinuses and all the cords and IVs were cumbersome, she really wasn't in a lot of pain and her mind was still sharp. I will always cherish that time with our whole family singing, laughing, crying, and reminiscing about the past. But something both amazing and peculiar happened and we all noticed. Mom wasn't sad. Throughout this whole process, 
We were all very emotional, but my mom never cried even once. I knew that she wouldn't be scared of dying because she was so sure of where she was going. Over, over the years, she spoke about that many times, how she had been looking forward to heaven ever since she was nine years old and accepted Christ as her Savior. But I definitely expected her to be sad for her family because of how empathetic she is by nature. And under normal circumstances, if someone she loved was crying, she would be right beside them crying as well. But now here we are all blubbering messes, and she was the one consoling all of us. Her strength and courage throughout the whole process carried us in a way that seemed supernatural. My mother always had a passion for life, and she never wanted to waste a single moment. She loved spending time around her family and friends and grandkids more than anything in the world. But when she found out her time was coming to an end, her focus shifted from earthly things to heavenly things, and she was no longer burdened by the temporary issues of this world. God was calling her home, and she was ready to enter into her reward. She wanted to be with Gavin and Bryson and other loved ones that had passed before her. But most of all, she wanted to finally meet Jesus and hear the words. that she's been longing to hear her entire life. Well done, good and faithful servant. Which brings us back to Paul's letter to Timothy. He knew that despite being a very flawed and imperfect man, he had lived out his life's purpose. He fulfilled his destiny and accomplished the work that God sent him here to do. He had suffered greatly in this temporary life and was ready to receive his eternal reward in heaven. I believe that the only people who live out their God-given purpose can be that comfortable and at peace when they find themselves in the valley of the shadow of death. And I am so proud to say that my mother was one of those people. She ran her race. She fought the good fight. She did not conform to this world. And now she has received her crown of righteousness. So until we are all reunited in glory, her memory will be a blessing. And, the life, and her life will continue to be an inspiration for those of us that have chosen to follow that same path. I was supposed to pray, but I'm not going to because I didn't write anything down and the pastor prayed first. <laughs> I don't know who to give this to. Oh. We're going to sing a hymn together. Um, the family requested. So sing it loud so Susan can hear us all okay. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, you can hum along. This is my 
Gavin's verse. Um, that was about a, a week before uh, Gavin passed away. Um, he wrote a, a simple letter to me and it just said, thank you, dad, for everything. And then that verse was written down. So that's been a very meaningful verse in our family. Um, every day before supper, um, my family, kids, wife, we all say that verse before grace and my mom always anytime there was a, a large gathering she'd have that printed on a, a bunch of cards and we'd all say it together so um, I was asked to say another or read another scripture um, that one of course is the, the one that first came to mind um, the other one I'll, I'll read but I'd like to share a, a a memory from Grandma Julie that she once told me. Um, that was when my mom was just nine years old. She'd be reading in her, in her room with her light on at bedtime. And Grandma said that she would tell her she had to turn the light off and she would turn the light off for her. And when Grandma would go back and <coughs> check on her, Mom would be under the covers with a flashlight <laughs> reading her Bible. <clears throat> My mom, at such a young age, loved Jesus, and her faith only grew stronger. Scripture was not just words on a page for my mom. It was a lifeline, a source of comfort and courage even during her darkest days. 
She clung to the promises of God, finding peace in knowing that even in the midst of suffering, she was never alone. God surrounded mom with love, sustaining her through both the joys in life and the storms. One of the most precious gifts my mom left for us are the books that she authored. This one that I have with me is titled Hope for the Grieving Grandparent Finding Comfort in Scripture After the Loss of a Grandchild. It is a testament to mom's faith and resilience. In it, she poured out her heart and shared Bible verses that carried her through her deepest valleys of grief and pain. Today I have the honor of sharing one of those verses with you, straight from her book. This verse is the verse that mom read at Gavin's memorial service. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it from, from her book and then I'll read a little bit about what she said. It's Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then mom goes on to explain that at Gavin's memorial service, she says, I explained how this scripture practically screamed at me. It shone in my heart and lit me up with 2020 vision. I have always loved these words and I had them memorized for years, but suddenly they became crystal clear with new meaning. When I was a youngster, I remember Sunday school teachers talking about treasures in heaven. They went right along with gems in your crown. I really had no idea what they might actually be. Was this literal, I wondered? Will I get rubies in my crown if I give money to the poor? Will I get diamonds if I do something more spectacular? It was, very, it was all very elusive, yet I believed God had good things planned for us, and somehow I would build up treasures in heaven, maybe by sharing my faith with others, and for sure, if I could lead another person to Christ. But now, jumping right off the page was the gift of understanding the scripture completely. Gavin is my treasure in heaven. One of them, anyway, my most treasured one. The time we spent building our relationship, doing picture puzzles together, visiting, singing songs together, just loving each other as grandchildren and grandmas do. Nothing spectacular, just being together and building a relationship. The love we shared, I realized, will go on forever. And I can't, <clears throat> and I can't wait until the day I see his precious, smiling face again. As a lot of you remember my mom, or as I'm sure all of you remember my mom, <clears throat> remember also the, the value that she placed in her relationship with each of you. You are all treasures to her. And now we all have another treasure in heaven, my beautiful mom. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us and celebrating Susan. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sheila. Pat is my brother, and Susan was my dearest friend. This is my daughter, Mariah, here for moral support. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my family and I loved Susan even before her and Pat started dating. We were thrilled to have her join our crazy family, and she has been an important part of our family ever since. Susan was always kind, fun, and funny. 
If you knew her, you were very familiar with her beautiful smile, her laugh, and her warm, friendly presence. She made friends easily and did so everywhere she went, which is a lot of places. <laughs> she was always up for a new adventure. I had the privilege of living across the street from Pat and Susan and their four little kids for a couple of years when they lived in Bremerton. My relationship with Susan grew closer as I spent nearly every day with her and her four little kids. I was pregnant with Mariah when I moved there, and it was such a blessing laughing and learning with Susan. So many sweet memories, picnics on the beach at Illahi or at Evergreen Park, just a block away, and shopping, loved shopping. <laughs> Susan loves shopping, I love shopping, especially at thrift stores. And talk about adventures. One day, Susan had a great idea of her and I taking the kids to the giant Goodwill store in Seattle. <laughs> the five kids, her four-year-old twins, Josh and Carrie, her three-year-old Lene and one-year-old Ian, and my infant Mariah on the ferry. And then the Seattle City bus out to the huge Goodwill. With my umbrella stroller, big diaper bag, and Susan's backpack with lunches and snacks, of course. We were loaded down, but oh, what a great time we had. And found so many fun bargains. Some clothes and knickknacks, and each kid got to pick out a toy. We got a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> a Fisher-Price two-story garage, <laughs> big fire truck, and the girls got dolls with accessories. And we had to get all that and the five kids back onto the bus. <laughs> Susan got her kids and all their stuff on first, not a fast or easy process for sure. Then me, holding Mariah in a diaper bag on one hip, trying to fold the stroller and get it and my bag of bargains up the, <laughs> the stairs. By the time I got on, I got the last open seat close to the front. I looked back, and there's Susan with Ian and Lene in the very back, spilling into the aisle with most of their stuff. Then up towards about the middle of the bus, sitting on the edge of aisle seats, a few rows from each other, sat Carrie and Josh holding their toys and looking a, a little bit concerned. <laughs> Josh's two-story garage seemed as big as he was, but he was holding on tight. <laughs> By the time everyone was finally settled and the bus took off, Susan and I looked at each other down the long aisle of the bus and we both started laughing hysterically. We were shaking and crying, we were laughing so hard, the whole dumb scene seemed so ridiculous. <laughs> the amazing thing about that little story was there were so many more like it. Shopping adventures that resulted in big bargains and big laughs. Susan had a great sense of humor and laughed easily, especially at herself. She also had a very loving and generous soul. While they lived in Bremerton and while in Olympia too, Susan and Pat took road trips with the kids about every other summer to visit family in New Mexico. And they always took Mariah and I along so we could visit family too. It was such a blessing with Mariah growing up to know and love her cousins here and in New Mexico, thanks to Pat and Susan's generosity. Those are amazing adventures. A lot of stories with those two. Road trips to and from were as fun as visiting in family in New Mexico. Pat and Sue both, such kind, generous people, helped many people whenever they could. From little things to big things, they sold me one of their cars very cheap. More than one, I believe. They could have gotten a lot more for each of them. Pat and Susan, all during their marriage, never let a lack of surplus stop them from helping someone out. Whether it was money, a car, or a place to stay, they gave without expecting anything back. If you had ever visited one of their booths at the fairs or festivals, you know Susan's generosity. <laughs> You like that? Oh, here, just take it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, it's no big deal. We buy this stuff for less. Go ahead, take it. If you insisted on paying, she'd say, okay, well, just give me five bucks. <laughs> no matter what, if she knew you, you were going to get a discount. I have so much on my mind and my heart to tell you about Susan. I don't know if she could have known just how important her friendship is to me. So many fun memories I could share, but really it's the deeper side of Susan that changed me and made me a better person. So I decided to focus now on what it was that afforded Susan to live life with such joy, appreciation for life and people, 
such generosity, kindness, compassion, and strength. She started memorizing scripture, as you've heard, <laughs> when she was just a little girl. She loved learning about Jesus all her life. Her greatest passion was loving Jesus, wanting to know him and please him. She sought to love people like Jesus loved her. She forgave people, not hanging on to grudges. If she did someone wrong, she sought to make it right. She had a hunger for truth. Over the years, her relationship with Jesus grew, and she learned to trust him more and more and his promises. She never told me what I ought to believe, but she shared her beliefs and what she questioned. In fact, after church, she'd come home and look up the scripture that was read and preached on. She'd have questions and discuss what she thought was so right or maybe wrong about what the pastor was saying. Her interest in scripture was infectious, and she inspired me to look deep, more deeply into the Bible. She grew very strong in her faith and so very confident in him. The horribly tragic death of her grandson, Gavin, tore her to pieces. She was heartbroken, crushed, heartache. Those words don't even come close to describing the pain of losing a loved one so much. Yet, in that horrendous time, God was still faithful to be her strength, her comfort, and her peace. She did as she always has done every day up until that point and since she turned to God. Her first place to go in times of joy, fear, sadness, anger, anxiousness, and deep grief was to Jesus, her Lord. And she found him faithful to his promises to give her peace and comfort, to never leave her or forsake her. And she did the same when she got the diagnosis of cancer and when she lost her beloved grandson, Bryson. God is her refuge, her all in all. Her heart was never the same after losing the boys, it still hurt even till the day she died, but she also had hope. Jesus, our living hope. This hope isn't just a mere wish. It is a confident expectation of what God has promised. Hope's strength is in his faithfulness. As you heard, she wrote this book, Hope for the Grieving Grandparent to Help Others. I read through it again after she died and found the words that she wrote and the scripture she shared so comforting to me as I grieve her passing. And thank you, Susan. <laughs> Susan loved life. She loved her home, wherever it was at any given time. <laughs> she made her home so warm and inviting. She loved shopping, finding good bargains, of course. She loved jewelry. She didn't just survive day to day, she thrived. She truly lived life and lived it abundantly. She had so many things that she loved to do. Painting, writing, playing music. She loved experiencing life, but she had all those loves in proper priority. Above, above all those, she loved her family and she loved her friends, but even more so, she loved Jesus. And she was so ready, even excited, to go to heaven to be with him. Not because she was in a terrible situation, not because she hated being alive, but because she has stored up her treasures in heaven. Her relationship with God and living eternally in his glory is her greatest treasure and sharing eternal life with her grandsons and all her loved ones who have already entered heaven and those who will, treasures. It was incredible to see how much she enjoyed even her last day on earth. <laughs> Happy to have her family all around, telling stories, laughing, crying, singing, and praying. A beautiful closure to a life beautifully lived. Heavenly Father, I praise you for the holy, almighty God that you are. We thank you for giving Susan to us for all these years. Lord, as we look at Susan's life, may we also consider Jesus. May we consider our own hearts and where our treasures are. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you guide each of us to inquire more about you, your word, and your promises. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
the family would like to have an opportunity, maybe for five or six, to just kind of share if you have a a remembrance of Susan's life. And if you do have, would you just come up here and join me, and I'll pass you the mic here. Just a little something. I'm Dawn. I'm Susan's sister. I've got a new sister today. <laughs> and it's Sheila. I uh, had the opportunity to go to Israel back in 2010 with Margaret, my aunt. She was there on her uh, honeymoon. <laughs> I don't know how Susan and I kind of barged in on that, but we all went to, to Israel together, the four of us. and. Margaret and I were baptized together along with Susan. We had all been baptized in the past, but we thought we we would do that to hold each other accountable. And we love God so much and what he did for us, sending his son. Anyway, when we got home, after seeing the wonderful land of Jesus, um, I bought three three pens of three women that uh, Margaret... um, Susan and I all wore. And I see that Sheila now has Susan's. <laughs> so you're now our sister. And I appreciate you and I love you. And I love what everyone has said about my sister. I love her so much. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Anyone else? Oh, it's so beautiful to see so many people celebrating a beautiful life. It really was. I, um, my name is Penny, and I sell a garlic grater at the shows and fairs. I'm not much for speaking in front of people, although that would surprise people, because I pitch all day at the shows. But uh, my secret is the pitch. I lean on it. And uh, that's where I met Susan, you know, at the shows. And... Uh, Whenever I saw her, she was definitely very loving and kind, and uh, we clicked. And um, I just realized we have a lot more in common. I love thrift stores. (laughs) But I know her from the shows, and Pat, and they were always so kind. And uh, we felt close, even though the only time I saw her was at the shows and fairs, but I wish we had gotten together more because we have a lot in common and I'm just coming to know that. And uh, my pitch for you is live what you believe. I never knew what she believed, but I felt, I felt what she believed. It was very beautiful and I'm so glad she shared that with me, but uh, we share a lot more now. Thank you. I'll never forget Susan. I've known her a long time, like Penny, at the fairs, Yuma, Arizona, wherever we went. If they were there, we got together. The last time I saw Susan and Pat was at Elmer's. We had breakfast with them. I never knew she'd leave us so quick, though, and I'm going to miss her. They were very, very good people. I can't say no more. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, um, my name's Kate, and I'm Susan's niece. And um, I was very fortunate enough to visit Susan in the hospital and be part of um, sharing the stories of of, uh, fun pastimes. And um, one of the things she had her son Josh read a special moment of when she was on the way to her own aunt's funeral. She was memorizing scripture, and 
as she was walking through the airport, this scripture that she was memorizing was being played on the piano. And she saw this as a real miraculous moment. And in the hospital, she turned and looked at me and she said, do you remember that, Katie? I called you right after. Because she used to call me um, and share whenever there was something that she saw that was miraculous. And she was always looking out for those things, those things that God was doing. And she was always giving him the glory for those things. And so that's something that I will always remember and do in my own life and that everyone else should too if you see that even if they seem like small moments um, of giving them the glory, they're, they're miracles. Anyone else? Hi. Um, I'm Anne. I'm one of Pat's younger sisters. And <laughs> one of them. Um, I just wanted, I was one of the ones that the family said, hey, do you need something? Come live with me for a while. But I also went, moved up to Washington the very first time Pat and Susan came to Washington. They had two three-year-olds, an 18-month-old and an infant. And so with four kids under three, three and under, Susan and Pat asked me, would you like to come and help? <laughs> well, being a teenager who didn't want to stay at home, <laughs> I was like, right on. But I remember when we first drove into the Washington area, the, the, the beauty of Washington just struck us all amazingly, and I knew that Susan would always be associated to Wash with Washington. But I want to tell you, you can't talk about Susan without talking about Pat. I don't remember a day in my life that Susan wasn't around because I was so young when they got married. But I've never seen Pat without Susan, and I've never seen Susan without Pat. Even if they're not physically together, they're emotionally and spiritually together. And I just want to tell you that everything that we're saying here about Susan, we also love and know about Pat. And Pat, I just want to tell you that I'm so, so sorry that you're going to have to finish your life without her here. But know that you're, everything that we're talking about and we believe and we love about Susan is double for you at this point in my life. I love you. Maybe time for one more. I'm probably one of the first people to meet the Price family when they moved to Washington. I'm not the first, but it's probably five. And Josh and I got off to a horrible start. <laughs> um, but uh, his mom and dad were probably uh, the epitome of a perfect marriage. And I have seen a lot in my life, and I have not always been good, but they've always loved and accepted me and made time for me. And I think it may have felt worse when she looked at me in disappointment <laughs> than maybe my own mom. <laughs> um, but uh, I truly feel for you all, and I'm very, very excited she's with her treasures. And I'm very sad for myself that she is gone. Well, there will be a reception afterwards, and there'll be more time to share your stories with the family. I'm going to invite our worship folks to come back up.
sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lasts before me, then maybe sing. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. I worship His holy. I have to tell you, I, I, I've never had such a hard time getting to writing a memorial service, and I think subconsciously I just didn't want to accept that Susan is gone. Uh, she was a, a dear friend. I've known her since my second year pastoring here in April of 2013. She and I got to go to the Dominican Republic together with some other folks to see up close the work of children of the nations. And if you spend time with Susan, how do you not fall in love with her? We had such meaningful experiences walking through barrier, bar, the barrios, uh, uh, places that look like this. Our hearts got broken for a young man named Daniello, and we we tried to kind of lift him up out of uh, a poverty. Both of his parents had died. We even got a chance to tour a coffee plantation on the kind of incredible estate of a man who owned Presidente beer. You don't usually go to the estate of a beer magnet with your pastor, but <laughs> that I, I, I may have been the naughtiest point in Susan's life. It was a wild time. But Susan became a dear friend to me. It was clear to me immediately that Susan's faith was not a passing fancy, but it was the bedrock of her life. And as you heard, um, there wasn't a lot of wickedness that she got into. The, the, the kind of naughtiest thing was uh, reading her Bible when she had been told lights out and she wanted to read the Bible a little bit longer. And that checks out what I know about Susan. 
When Susan walked through the most difficult paths that a grandparent can traverse in this life, she turned her search for solace in Scripture, as you heard, into a book. You can get this on Amazon, a book of hope for grandparents who were grieving so that they might have lessened uh, spiritual agony. And she wrote in this book, my sister-in-law, very dear friend Mary, gave me a diary right after the accident. She said that she thought it would be helpful for me to write things down. It was. Sometimes I could only put down words, no sentences. Now I look back on those words and realize that I did have a book to help me. Scripture ran through my head over and over. They were the words that brought me peace and hope. This is Susan Price, someone who loved God's word, a wounded healer who tried to ease the pain of others with the wisdom that she had learned in life. And it seems appropriate on this day where we're grieving her loss that we would turn to the book that so often gave Susan solace, uh, to a prayer that she often prayed over her children. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every heaven in earth and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. If you're grateful for it, say thanks be to God. God. When Susan was on her deathbed, I got a call and she asked me to preach the gospel. And I said, I think I can do that. And so we're going to do that today. This passage of scripture that you were read is, is by a guy named Paul, but once he was a Pharisee named Saul, quite a notable gentleman. He was one of the best trained Jewish Pharisees that there were. He was trained under a guy named Gamaliel, who was a doctor of Jewish law. He was someone who knew the high priest. When the high priest wanted someone that he could trust to go out and systematically persecute and dismantle this new movement of Jesus Christ. He turned to Saul as someone who could get the job done. But Saul had a glorious encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, blinded by his glory as Jesus asked him one question, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He became blinded by Jesus' glory and miraculously he received back his sight and recognizing that he was persecuting God's movement on earth, he converted and, and he became known, instead of his Jewish name Saul, he became known by his Roman name Paul. And oddly enough, means little. Kind of taking on a humble identity for himself. This was a man who didn't like to be around Gentiles and their unclean ways 
who now says in our scripture, by God's grace, I was made a minister of Jesus's good news. I once persecuted it, but now I'm a minister of this gospel. And that good news for Paul in part is that God has made all people, the Gentiles, non-Jews, he's made them fellow heirs of Abraham, fellow, fellow partakers in the promises that God gave to Abraham. And he says, can you believe it? How lucky am I that even though I'm the least of the apostles, the least of the saints, I get chosen to be able to expound the the, the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. This is a remarkable, radical change in the life of someone. It's as dramatic as if a white supremacist kind of came around and said, praise God, I get to hang out with the Jews and black people. I get to preach the gospel to my fellow brothers, my fellow heirs. It's a radical change that Jesus does in Paul's life. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ will rearrange your priorities. It will undo your biases. It will take hold of your life and your lifestyle, and it does so radically. Many of us, like Saul, we erroneously believe that salvation is somehow about becoming good enough for God. We've got this big debt of sin, and we kind of whittle away that debt by doing good stuff, by reading the Bible, by, by, by giving to charity, and, and, or not hanging around with the wrong people, that somehow we, we keep tipping the stells until we get right with God. But you could never do enough good. There's nothing wrong with doing good. The world could use some more good deeds. But you will never be able to work off your debt. The only thing that saves us is not our own righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness by his blood shed for us. The only thing that saves us is what saved Saul. When he was in the midst of, of doing evil, he has this encounter with God, and God doesn't say, now you have to do this, this, and this in order to be saved. No, what does he do? He forgives him. He changes his life. He puts him on the path to glory. It's only through an encounter with God, only through God's grace, only through God's goodness and love are we to be saved, as Paul was. And I wonder if you've surrendered to the love of God and allowed it to wash over your life and to wash away your sin. Before his encounter with Jesus, I'm guessing that Saul probably thought, I'm kind of crushing it as a religious person. There's no one better than me and my ability to keep the rules. I can do religious stuff better than most. But when Jesus got a hold of him, he realized just how sinful he was. This is the gospel of Jesus writ large, that you are more sinful and broken than you'd ever imagine. And yet, when you take a look at Jesus and what he did for you, you are more loved in God through Christ than you would ever dare to dream. That he's made a way for you to have eternal life, that he's made a way for you to make this life more rich, more beautiful, more kind and gentle, as Susan did. God's love then radically empowers you, as it did for Paul, to love others, to love even your enemies in a graceful way, because you realize you've won the lottery. You have the treasure of all treasures. You have the unsearchable riches of Christ. God's love and forgiveness. And that changes your perspective about everybody. You begin to see the possibilities of new life for everyone in your life. Susan saw the possibilities in everyone she encountered. She knew this radical trust in Jesus Christ. Carrie, her daughter, said to me, Susan's table was always open to her friends. 
Susan's friends or Carrie's friends. It was always open, and anyone could come and sit down at the table, and if there was anything about Susan, she didn't judge anyone. If she did anything, she wore her heart on her sleeve and was always willing to pray for others. And she did pray, as Paul prays in this passage, oh, that you would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Oh, that you would come to have this comprehensive knowledge, a a mastery of the love of Jesus Christ, to know the love of Jesus Christ in all of its dimensions. Why? So that you could be filled with the fullness of God. Susan would say, if she were here, if there's anything lovely about my life, it came from this mastery of knowing the love of Christ of digging into Scripture and remembering how Jesus loved me. And that faith was her strength when the storms of life began to blow, whether it was cancer. She was rooted in love, full of the life of God. That love and joy and peace, that patience and kindness and goodness that gentleness, that faithfulness, that self-control. It's what we Christians call the fruit of the Spirit. It was fully formed in her. She so beautifully exemplified that fruit. And that came from a, a lifetime of meditating on her Savior's love for her. And God can do that same work in us. We can become that loving, that joyful, that peaceful, that patient, that kind, that good, if we'll allow Jesus to do his work in us as Susan did and allow his love to seep out of us in in all kinds of interesting ways. But there's an interesting caveat here. Knowing the love of Christ, being saved by Jesus, does not guarantee that life will be rainbows and lollipops. Paul kind of sneaks in a little verse here, and it goes by so quick you might miss it. He says, therefore, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. Wait a second. I thought Jesus chose Paul. I I, I thought he redeemed Paul. Why is he suffering? This guy that that Jesus radically transformed, this guy who's traveling all over the known world to preach Jesus to whoever will listen to him, what gives? Actually, Paul will be martyred. Tradition says he was beheaded during a persecution during the time of Nero. The gospel does not indicate that Christians will never have suffering in their lives. Quite the opposite. He taught his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Susan was familiar with suffering. But don't take my word for it. Listen to her. It is heartbreaking to think of our Savior hanging on the cross thirsty. The human side of the God of the universe thirsts. How can that even be possible? If he thirsts, how much more do I? I am reminded of the story where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. In John 4, he tells her that if she knew who he was, she would be asking him for living water. He goes on to tell her that whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. John 7 explains that the living water is the Holy Spirit. In 2009, our 12-year-old grandson, Gavin, died in a car accident. I was completely devastated. I was spiritually bankrupt. I was thirsty for the promised living water. I never thought anything terrible like that could happen in our family. I had prayed diligently for my children and grandchildren. I trusted God to take care of them, to let them outlive me. Now there I was, with no one to turn to. I was raised a Southern Baptist, and one thing Baptists do is learn and memorize scripture. That is where my living water came from. The Holy Spirit brought so many verses to my heart and mind. I was bathed in them. They gave me hope to go on. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, was one I did repeat over and over. 
I'm not saying it was easy or that I just recited those verses and moved on. That was not the case. But the more I concentrated on them, the more I was able to hold on, especially at night when I was overwhelmed with worry and fear and tears. Jesus prompted me to put the scriptures together in a book about finding comfort in scripture after the loss of a grandchild, hoping to help others. In it, I've listed many of the scriptures that have helped me. Unfortunately, a month before this book was published, we experienced another tremendous loss. Twelve years after Gavin died, our firstborn grandson, Bryson, passed away. He was 24. He and Gavin were just six months apart in age. They were best friends. He went to sleep the night of November 3, 2020, after hanging Christmas lights in his daughter's room, and he never woke up. He left a wife and two young children. Once again, our hearts were broken and we wondered how we could go on. Going through the death of two grandchildren and now for the last nine years, I've been fighting breast cancer. We are so grateful to have a savior who knows and understands our suffering. Jesus walks with us through our grief. He knows what we are going through because he went through grief and loss too. Psalm 56, eight says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. It's quite clear that she knew that living water, that the Lord was Susan's shepherd, that she trusted him to hold on to her tears. You know, a life that didn't have Jesus, how easy it could have been through the death and the cancer, to become bitter and angry and to give up on God. But what she chose to do was to remember the gospel, to remember that God is who he says he is, to trust that the Lord knew her sorrows because he was well acquainted with grief, because he knew what it was to hang on that cross in agony and to cry out, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? O Lord, that did not leave us alone in our suffering and our grief, but came alongside of us. But also a shepherd who makes the promise, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back to take you, to be with me where I am, that you may be there also. And we believe that Susan's tears of pain today have given way to tears of joy. As Gavin ran to meet her, and then Bryson, and then of course Jesus, her faith is now sight. The great Presbyterian pastor, Peter Marshall, has a great illustration about heaven. I wonder if I could close with this. Two caterpillars were walking and talking together as they crawled along the earth. One declared, I imagine that heaven will be like an endless row of cabbages. We get to eat forever and ever. His more spiritual, philosophical friend said, you know, I don't know about that. I I think someday we'll do better than crawling. One day we might even get to fly over that fence. What's more, rather than puncturing cabbage leaves in order to eat, we'll be sipping on, on the dew and living in the honey of the flowers. His friend replied, you poor demented creature, how foolish to be thinking of supernatural things. I'm only interested in the here and now, that which I can taste and touch and feel. I'm content with my life amongst the cabbages. Well, both of the caterpillars died, friends gathered to at the funeral service, a beautiful eulogy. And they were buried in a shroud, a chrysalis. And then one day that chrysalis broke. And out of it emerged the most moist, lovely thing, slowly hoisting its wings, its delicate wings of beauty into the fragrant air. They began to dry and gather strength as Both butterflies became aware of their new world, and for the first time they took off and began to fly, sailing over the fence. And and indeed, they sipped the dew and they tasted this succulent honey that they could one could only dream of. And that skeptical caterpillar said with his eyes filled with amazement to his friends, how blind I was. I couldn't have even imagined in my wildest dreams that anything could be better than my life amongst the cabbages. 
And now that looks like nothing from here compared to the beauty of sailing in the wind and enjoying new life as butterflies. When you think about how beautiful Susan was in this kind of caterpillar form, can you imagine what she's like now as that metaphorical butterfly? Can you imagine the joy as she sails through the winds of heaven and sips the dew of heaven? We all know that she would have been the one dreaming and thinking about what heaven was like. And now she has a very different viewpoint. Her vantage point, she can now see even more clearly how God did far above, more abundantly than all that she could ask for or imagine. And think about that. Because you know that she prayed for you. She prayed that you would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. She prayed that you would know the love of Christ. She prayed that you would be filled with God. Oh, that her prayers might be answered. Oh, that we would allow God to love us, to fill us, so that we might fly with her again in the endless bliss of the glory of God's presence and with her to taste the dew of heaven. Oh, Susan, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs receive you at your arrival and lead you into that holy city, Jerusalem. May choirs of angels receive you and with Lazarus once poor. May you have eternal rest in the presence of eternal love for your eternal life with Christ. Amen.
some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'm going to invite our elder, Phil, if you would come up and uh, we're going to invite the family to head over to get their cookies. I'm going to have you guys go over there because if you don't go there, one, you won't get the best cookies. These people will eat them all and we want to make sure that you get them and so that you get a chance to, to, to uh, get seated and then we'll let the, everyone uh, move after that. Let me close this time in prayer. Father, how can we say thanks for this gift of knowing Susan? What gratitude can we offer that's sufficient enough to you who made her through your great love? We have hope that we will be gathered with her together around your throne one more day, that today is not goodbye, but until we meet again. Oh, that you would strengthen us in the Holy Spirit. Oh, that you would root us and ground us in love. Oh, that you would fill us with yourself, that we might bring glory to your name. As Susan is done, Susan's race is done, and yet our race stretches out before us. Let us run in such a way to capture the prize. Fill us with the hope of heaven, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.